Welcome, Philippe. Hello, and uh, good evening, and welcome, bienvenidos, friends of the Hispanic Society, to an installment of our program, Las Tertulias de Arte Hispano, or Hispanic Art Gatherings. These gatherings, as by now you know, are usually for our members, but we have opened this preview to everyone in celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month and our special outdoor installation. I thank you once again to our members who have joined us monthly since May and welcome on all those who are uh, tuning in for the first time. We continue these conversations on the first Tuesday of each month at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you are not yet a member, please do consider joining by going to our website, and uh, which is called hispanicsociety.org, and search uh, for membership under support. Now today, I have the pleasure of speaking with the Hispanic Society's head curator of prints and metalwork, Patrick Lenegan. Patrick will introduce us to the new and frankly very exciting initiative, an outdoor installation entitled Treasures on the Terrace, highlights from the Hispanic Society Museum and Library. It opens to the public this coming Thursday on the 24th. Dr. Lenegan, who received his BA from Columbia and his PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU, worked at the Metropolitan Museum of Art before joining the Hispanic Society in 1995. Since then, Patrick has organized numerous international uh, loan exhibitions, such as Imágenes del Quixote at the Prado in Madrid. In his work on photography, Lenegan has examined how images of Spain and Latin America were created in the 19th and 20th centuries and how they provide a the most valuable chronicle of a way of life irretrievably lost. He has also written widely on Spanish Renaissance and Baroque sculpture in books and journals. The idea, by the way, to do an outdoor installation came from an exhibition I heard about serving on the board of the Prado Museum, namely a show of large reproductions the Prado sent to several Spanish cities and later to Guatemala City. Patrick will shortly guide us through this outdoor installation, which allows us to share a collection with the community in a safe, socially distanced space during this pandemic. After Patrick's presentation, we will have a conversation, Q&A, about his talk, and we invite you to join afterward by submitting your questions to the comments section. And you should know that you may submit your questions and comments at any point during the discussion. Thank you to all of you. And here now is Dr. Lenegan. Well, thank you, Philippe, for the kind introduction. And uh, without any more ado, let's move. Oops. Oh, darn it. I've got to find where I was. Move on to the um, presentation I have here. Oof. Going. All right, there we are, sorry about that. So we find ourselves today in unprecedented times. <laughs> How often have we heard that? Among the many things affected is the way we experience art. Traditionally, a viewer looking at a work found himself or herself in a quiet world, contemplating an object of great beauty from a past era. Today, we are far from that as many challenges confront us in general and the Hispanic society in particular. In these circumstances, this outdoor installation offers a way to bring the collection to the public at a time when things are so very different. Since going inside seems today less attractive than being outside, we have tried to compensate for this in a way that allows us to use modern technology to bring the collection of the Hispanic society to the public. In the first place, we've turned to the idea of large scale photography. While such images can never replace the original artwork, they can recall it vividly and even inspire us. Similarly, we have turned to other media to enhance the experience. And as um, Philippe said, we thought uh, we looked at the, the Prado's example where they took art 
throughout Spain. You see on the left, uh, Siguenza, and on the right, uh, Albacete. And we have taken this idea and we have built on it to create something where we've got our works of art and along with it for the viewer's experience, we have a website which has entries for each of the pieces and the entries have comparative images drawn from the Hispanic society's holdings. We have also a bilingual audio guide which has been narrated by voices from the community. So ideally we would have been all walking through this in person, but since we're all doing this by Zoom, I thought we would do this virtually. The first thing that comes up is the question of the space of Audubon Terrace. What the viewer sees today has evolved as the Hispanic society grew and the city developed. When Huntington founded the museum, Washington Heights was a suburban area with open spaces and wood frame Victorian houses that one could see the block from 155th, 157th Street all the way up to 156th and back to the museum seems unimaginable today. Yet that's what we see in this photograph. From the beginning, Huntington intended that his museum should be a place open to the public at no charge. Moreover, an event like the Soroya exhibition of 1909 attracted viewers in record numbers. As you can see, the terrace faced onto 156th Street and there was little of the access to the space that we have today. By the late 1920s, however, the terrace had acquired much, if not all of its present look and feel. All the while, the space continued to serve as a public function. So here you see it, uh, and it's quite close to how it is today. But in 1923, Huntington welcomed the National Sculpture Society exhibition, which happened not just inside the building, but also on the terrace. The memory of this event shows how far we have come, while also how we are continuing a tradition with this uh, installation today. By its structure, the uh, installation provides visitors a chance to wander through the terrace the, and to think about art in a new context. For me, as I look at it, the question of uh, portraits arise and you know, we take advantage of this chance to see the works out of their context and to rethink about them. And in particular, what it means when an artist paints a portrait of a known person. And here we start with uh, Soroya's portrait of Louis Comfort Tiffany. He turned to uh, Soroya, he'd met him at that 1909 exhibition where he acquired four works and he decided to commission his portrait from the Spaniard. A, this portrait is a case of like-minded artists finding a common ground. Soroya was always keen to uh, reveal the psychology of a sitter. And in this case, he seems to have found a kindred spirit enamored of nature and color. So he's painted Tiffany seated in his garden of his house facing the Long Island Sound. A different portrait shows some of the complexities that can appear in this format. It's uh, one of Goya's most famous paintings and one of the stars of our collection, but it raises questions of what is a portrait. While one normally thinks of a portrait along the lines of what we just saw with Soroya and Tiffany, that the, a sitter commissions the artist for a portrait. In this case, it's very different because this is a work that has remained, that remained with the artist. It has enigmatic overtones and it uh, clearly had great personal meaning to Goya. And when we compare this work with works in the Hispanic society, we begin to see what, how this plays out. The viewer at the, ex the installation will be able to see the two rings that she holds that say Alba and Goya. Uh, at her foot, it says Solo Goya. So there's obviously something about the relation between the Duchess and Goya that's here. Uh, if you look at the website, uh, you will see comparative images. We've got here an image of a drawing by Goya, which shows two Mahas fighting. The Duchess is portrayed as a Maha. What does Goya mean by this? The Maha is in Madrid, a lower class urban figure known for their personality, character and beauty, but also perhaps their uh, unfettered uh, behavior. And in this case, we see the two women engaged in a flat out brawl. But 
the maha and the ambiguous or ambivalent morality of the woman is something that Goya also explores in his caprichos. Here's a capriccio that says, God forgive her, and it was her mother. The story behind this is a little ambivalent. Is the woman, uh, there, there, there are multiple interpretations. The woman has married up above her station and has left her poor family behind. A beggar accosts her. She, re she rebuffs the beggar, and the beggar turns out to have been her mother. God forgive her, and it was her mother she rebuffed. Or is it that the mother is coming up to this woman and suggesting to her, look, really, you should um, basically either prostitute yourself literally or marry for money. And in this case, God forgive her. And it was her mother who made the suggestion. When we know that Goya thinks this way about these, the, these sort of people in this kind of environment, and then we look back at the portrait, the ambivalence creeps in. And then finally, there's this image from the Caprichos, Vola Beirunt, which means they have flown. Um, and here is someone who is, the woman is traditionally thought to be perhaps the Duchess of Alba. And what does Goya mean in this setting when he shows this woman flying off? It's um, whatever it is, it can't be good for the Duchess. And this is uh, an enigmatic image that goes way beyond what traditionally one thinks of a portrait. Portraiture in a different context shows on the terrace with the selection, because here we have Velasquez's portrait of a little girl who is probably one of his granddaughters. This painting stands out because Velasquez has painted few figures who are not uh, members of the royal family or attached to the court or figures politically significant in his world. In the other two Velasquez paintings in the Hispanic society, the Count Duke of Olivares or Cardinal uh, Pamphili here, both embody that sort of official public portrait. But in this case, we have something that uh, is rather different. It, uh, again, it's a painting that stayed with the artist in his inventory, just as the Duchess of Alba had stayed with Goya. And it's a very quiet, intimate picture. And for an artist who seems who, like Velasquez, who is generally so reticent, this glimpse of something intimate stands out uh, even more. When we um, look at some of the Latin American works included, we find an equally remarkable range in terms of pictures that seem initially to be portraits, but may have something more going on. Here we have a portrait of Maria Catalina de Urrutia, who, which is a very appealing portrait, which points to the sophistication of life in Latin America in the 18th century. The sitter comes from an important family in Puerto Rico, and she was the wife of the governor general there. She's dressed in elegant finery. She stands out, she stands before the artist, presumably in a room in the governor's palace. Some sense of the sophistication of the world she inhabits comes when we realize that the costume she's wearing is the latest fashion uh, from Spain from, with the double watch and the elegant and elaborate hairstyle and hat. But it's the artist's skill with his pearl-like colors and lustrous brushwork that brilliantly shows not just her beauty, but also the elegance of this cultivated woman. We also have uh, this painting by Juan Rodriguez Juarez, the Castas, which might at first glance look like a portrait of a family or a genre scene, but actually it belongs to something quite different, a series known as the Castas. These images defined and labeled racial mixtures in the 18th century colonial society. In this work, the inscription, um, Mestizo and Indian producer Coyote, explains the scene. A man of European and Amerindian parentage has married an indigenous woman, and they stand before us with their son. Juarez skillfully renders the clothing and the details that confirm their identities. The man holds a horn for snuff. The woman wears a headdress and an embroidered uh, garment that is uh, made with indigenous uh, textiles from Oaxaca, from Oaxaca. The elegantly dressed boy clutches white pears, which are a delicacy and a sign of uh, status. So we're looking at people of some social distinction. Yet we can appreciate again Juarez's talent when we look at other paintings of this series, or in this case, we have a print from our collection of the same 
subject. Here we have a Spanish printmaker uh, who has, this is part of a series of costume sets and he's treated the same subject. You can see that the Mestizo, the father is shown again as a man of status riding a horse. The mother is similarly a person of status elegantly dressed. The artist for being in Spain is not really as good uh, or able to render what is an indigenous fabric or clothing, but he's got the same social dynamic. And when we look at the two, we can appreciate, I think, again, the art, the painter's talent uh, as he portrayed these people within the context of this genre of Costas, but also as his ability to make this look like something real and plausible. Similarly, we have here the uh, painting of the Costeño by Arieta that Marcus spoke at the Tertulia many months ago. This sympathetic portrayal of the young man and its dazzling rep representation of the fruit and the Mark this canvas as one of the masterpieces of the painter. His superb technique and his effortless naturalism make it easy to overlook how this painting belongs to a tradition in Mexican art, as Marcus said, that focuses on popular figures and types. Now, looking at the website, um, the viewer of this exhibition can compare this painting with a print like this one by Linate of a costeño or this one from um, Colombia of a seller of potatoes. And the, my point is that here we have the same type, uh, someone from the Gulf Coast, the Veracruz. Here we have the interest in market scenes in, in Colombia. And here we have an interest uh, of the market scene in Peru. So we get a sense of the interest in these moments of daily life, how it's part of a artistic expression and genre that's being developed. And when we compare these works to the painting, we can, under, we can appreciate how Arieta has taken these elements and brought them before us in such a vivid and engaging way that it looks as if it's a real person, a particular portrait, but we need to recall and remember that it's part of this tradition and it's part of this visual conventions. A bit further afield, perhaps, uh, geographically as well as uh, artistically, is this, the map of the Ucayali River. This relates uh, to the history of Latin America and the missionaries who came there with the aim of converting the, the, the indigenous people they found. It's got in its details, though, as they map out, literally, the Ucayali River, which is a tributary of the Amazon in uh, Peru, in the Amazonian uh, river basin there. It it's, it's reflects the, their experience. And as we look at the details, we see many engaging and charming aspects rendered there. And it's a part of what makes the map so, so appealing. But it also corresponds to the historical moment of the 17th and 18th century as the missionaries entered the area and tried to establish a presence. And it also reflects uh, the richness of the Hispanic society's collection of maps and of colonial material. The last of the portraits I think I wanna look at in this whirlwind tour of our installation is Ramon Casas's poster for the Café Catregats in Barcelona. He and his friends, the painter Santiago Rusignol and uh, Zuluaga, well, no, he and his friends Santiago Rusignol and Per Romeo founded this café. And there what they wanted to do was to recreate the uh, spirit of the cafes they'd seen in Paris to make it a place where uh, contemporary art could thrive and an era, a place that would bring in some of the exciting things they had seen in Paris to their Barcelona neighbors. So this poster is part of their artistic revival. And in this poster, Casas advertises a shadow puppet, puppet play in which cutout figures are moved in front of a lit screen, thus creating shadows while performers sang or recited. 
In this image, Casa shows a elegant woman seated on the left. In the middle, in the blue, are five artists, which include, and you can follow my cursor, you can see there, Ramon Casas. Here, uh, Miguel Utrillo, who is his co-creator of the um, poster. In the back is Santiago Rusignol, who is feature, who is the artist of another uh, painting in, exhibited on the terrace. And here we have Ignacio Zuluaga, who is also an artist of another work exhibited on the terrace. So they, they're, they sit in the blue as if they are in the dark, sort of looking on. And what they're looking on at is the screen where we've got here and the words sombras shadow in front of it. And we have this man here standing in front of it like one of the cutout figures in, that's gonna be projected onto it. This man, this almost caricature is Per Romeo, their friend and co-owner of the cafe. And again, on the installation here, you'll be able to compare this image of Per Romeo with this one. And you can see quite the difference between them. Here he looks at, uh, in this one on the right, he looks out at us uh, as he sits behind the bar and there's all this wild carousing and revelry going back behind them. And he looks out at us sort of inquisitively, inquisitively, you know, almost as if he's inviting us to join in. And it's uh, a testament to Ramon Casas's a talent as portrait and a graphic artist, how he can incorporate these images of his friend and in the one on the right, and also on the left, how he incorporates them in a wonderful conceit that evokes the event of the shadow puppet theater. And for me, if the image of the sombras catragats make us think of how artists turn to alternative technology for their expressive purposes to evoke an aesthetic higher truth in the Barcelona of circa 1900, I think looking at these same portraits in photographic reproductions today, on the terrace can help sharpen our appreciation of art in the Hispanic society. So that's the uh, whirlwind tour of this installation that I wanted to share with you. Wow, well, <clears throat> thank you so much, Patrick. This was really absolutely fascinating. And uh, I, I'm glad that you used the term uh, alternative technologies because in fact, uh, in placing these simulacra, uh, in kiosks on uh, the terrace, what we are doing is, but in a very different way, what so many museums are doing under the circumstances in which we live today, where uh, they are giving virtual tours that people access and find in their apartments on their PCs. Uh, what um, people uh, will be able to do, what you will be able to do, uh, who are watching this program is actually go to 155th Street, to Washington Heights, uh, uh, to the site of the Hispanic Society and, and perambulate in uh, the whole area uh, a little bit as if you were in a museum itself. They are reproductions, but you'll be uh, having a, a quasi social experience. One hopes there will be others socially distancing as well. Uh, this leads me also to uh, the question. You've given us, Patrick, an enormous amount of information. Uh, how is that information or a portion of that information going to be communicated uh, on, on or through these kiosks on the terrace? Well, the, uh, the kiosks have um, very short labels on them. They come with a, a QR code that takes you to the website and to the uh, for the exhibition. And from there, you can also get to audio guides. Um, there are most, almost all, but not all, have an audio component with them. So depending on whether you want 100 words, 400 words, or 300 words, you have your choice. And the thing, the appealing thing too, is that we worked uh, to find these comparative images. So there are about three to four comparative images for each work so that when you call up the page for each image, you've got alternatives. I mean, I showed you the ones for the Duchess and uh, for 
the costas and but in 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 the case of other artists they're the alternative work other works by that same artist that we have works that are related uh, for costume or period or for genre so that it it it, it invites the the viewer to think about the work that they are seeing and at the same time to make comparisons to other things that might be related. And all of these comparatives come from the Hispanic Society collection. So it's a sign of uh, just the depth of the collection that we, are, we have these comparatives drawing on our own holdings. Well, that's a perfect answer, wonderful. And uh, I look forward to uh, visiting the site myself and uh, uh, watching and experiencing the the, the uh, social interchange that will occur as well as looking at the pictures. We have quite a number of viewers on the program and I know there are a number of questions. And so uh, I think Christina Aldrich is on the line and probably ready to communicate them to us. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you, Patrick, for a great presentation. Uh, we have someone wondering, someone has emailed in and said that they walked by the installation and they were really inspired uh, by seeing these reproductions in person and they can't wait to, to you know, come closer and interact with them. But they're wondering if the Hispanic Society will consider uh, in the future and especially if this quarantine and global pandemic continues, if, um, if they will be able to see original works of art in the terrace space, for example, sculpture or any contemporary uh, installations by artists who are, are working in media that can be shown outdoors. Uh, who gets to answer that? Um, you want me to answer it? Uh, let me uh, sure. Let me answer that, which is to tell you that uh, we have not been idle in the last few months uh, at the Hispanic Society, both trustees and staff. And uh, we uh, are preparing to open uh, as soon as we can, it conceivably will be this fall, uh, in the building closest to Broadway, a special exhibition gallery in which we will be able to mount exhibitions of original works of art. They'll be indoors, but as the museums have done around New York City, you will be able to go in. Uh, it'll be controlled, certain number of people um, per hour and so forth. Uh, and uh, this will give us an opportunity to work with the community, to work with artists in the community, possibly have exhibitions that are conversations uh, between contemporary artists and their works uh, alongside the works of uh, traditional works from older periods from Latin America and Spain. So uh, as soon as we are ready with this, we will announce it and we will open wide the doors to all of you. Wonderful, thank you. We have another uh, member emailing in and they would like to know how the decision was made um, in terms of which objects and uh, were selected to be reproduced in these high quality images. And, and Patrick, you mentioned portraits. If there was any other criteria or themes that um, were decided in terms of how to, how to select and display these. Well, um... I'll leave Philippe to answer the first part of the question, but the second I can answer first. Um, I, I um, As I walked through it, it was the, the question of portraits that jumped out at me, but they're not by any means all portraits. I um, I looked for a thread that I thought might work to, to, uh, because, to explain it, because what I saw is that as the works were out of their usual context for me, new things be, jumped out at me. And I thought that was one of the interesting positives of this kind of an experience because working at the Hispanic Society for 25 years, I've just come to expect certain pieces to be in certain places in the building. And you know, just simply moving the reproductions around a little put 
created a new uh, context and environment, and I saw new, I saw things in a slightly different way. The idea was, I think, to work to the the, uh, the collection as it was presented was to be according to different criteria. That the portrait was just something I saw as I went through it. And I think Philippe has probably got a better idea of how the actual selection process evolved since I think you were there for most of the way from beginning to uh, end. Well, uh, <clears throat> I actually did not make the selection. I think the selection was made by our assistant director, uh, Margaret McQuaid, working with uh, uh, other members of the staff. And it is only one presentation uh, we have every expectation that uh, over a period of time, uh, new reproductions of different works of art uh, yeah. be placed in these, on these kiosks. Um, we hope to be able to have the kiosks as well as the special exhibition gallery at the same time. And um, this is obviously um, a, set, a series of narratives that we will create it will evolve over time, and we aren't certain exactly what will happen once the uh, uh, the uh, COVID situation is over and people can circulate freely. It's quite possible that just as the Prado uh, sent their exhibition to uh, different places in Spain, uh, that we may be able to actually circulate uh, in different communities possibly even within New York City and other areas of New York or outside of New York um, to give greater visibility to the Hispanic Society and its collections and circulate it to uh, other cities around uh, the United States. Excellent, thank you. And we have another question uh, for Patrick. Uh, since you have seen the installation and walked through it, we have a member wondering if walking through this space and seeing the reproductions in different a different light, in natural light, has made you think about the works in a different way. If the sort of physical and atmospheric conditions have made you, and, and even positioning of, of the reproductions made you think about the collection in, in different ways. Uh, yes, it has. It's also made me think, but perhaps it doesn't take much to push me in this direction, about um, photography and modern technology. And because um, the one of the works I didn't show is uh, a colonial Mexican enconchado painting, which is a painting on a dark ground with mother of pearl in sort of mosaic encrusted into the surface. And it is an engaging scene of the um, wedding at Ima uh, the, the wedding at Cana where um, Jesus arrives and uh, the, they've run out of wine and he sa saves the situation by turning water into wine. And it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful colonial painting but it's always been very hard to see because there's a lot of dark, but there's also brilliant gold and shining uh, surfaces from the gold and from the uh, mother of pearl. And it's, it's hard to see the eye. When you see it, the eye adjusts back and forth naturally. The eye, the eye always makes many more adjustments than we realize. But when we had to photograph it for the uh, Tesoros catalog, it was quite hard, the lighting of it, and it really caused us a great deal of trouble, but the photographer is, is a wonderful uh, photographer and he got it. I think in the end it was done through a series, it was, it was very tricky. But the, uh, the photographic reproduction is in some ways, um, I, I looked at it and I thought of all the troubles one had to see it in, in real life. And I thought in some ways it was uh, what we were seeing it in this condition was we had uh, sort of, because of the lighting of the photography, we had gotten ourselves out of what is often a very tricky painting to light in real life. So it, in a crazy way, the photographic reproduction made it easier to see something that's very hard to see in real life. So I was uh, wryly abused that we always say, ah, the 
the original, the original, the original, but in this case, the lighting conditions in the photography made the reproduction in many ways easier to see. The, uh, I saw it on a Saturday uh, morning with bright, bright light. So the things that, that the light hit perfectly really were wonderful, but the things that were in shadow were harder to see. And it, it just made me think again about the, the way lighting hits things and that lighting is, is key. I mean, so I don't know that I've fully answered the question, but I, since I've been involved with the photography of these pieces, seeing the pieces in real life and then seeing them again, I've got these three different perspectives that come. And as I look at the photographic reproductions, I'm asking myself, well, what did we do wrong? What did we do right when we shot it? How are we doing as we look at this blown up? So I, I feel that I may not be totally the innocent uh, viewer. No, I'm certainly not an innocent viewer uh, to answer this question. What I, I fear is that my, my constant thinking of how it, the light is hitting it from a photographic point of view is probably shaping my perspective. Um, Patrick, you... You, you raised some very good points in this answer. And uh, I would even say, and I, I, I wonder uh, if there's not also another element to the, the whole process of the reproduction and the photography of the painting. In the case of an enconchado painting, where you have mother of pearl that reacts in different ways to different areas of lighting, uh, where you have shafts of light, moving shadows, reflections that change according to the light. Uh, the reproduction fixes uh, the object at a particular moment in time and in light. And so, uh, in a sense, uh, what is gained is a certain sense of permanence. What is lost is uh, the, the, that uh, shifting uh, quality that all these reflections give. Uh, on the painting. Isn't that the case? Yeah, I think so. I think that's, yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much to both of you. And we have another question about the audio available. So Patrick, you mentioned the audio available for the exhibition includes voices from the community. Could you elaborate? Was the, there other involvement by the Washington Heights community in the exhibition? Uh, I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Let me answer and see if in my answer, I've got it. Uh, what they decided, we, we wrote, um, we, we wrote uh, scripts for what we assumed the, the salient points of the paintings were. Uh, we reached out to friends and members in the community whom we know through you know, various uh, staff have had have built up relations with different people in the community over the years. And we, we uh, approached them, asked them if they wanted to read them. And what was interesting to me was that as they read the scripts, they, they looked at them and they pointed out things, uh, <clears throat> in one case, something that perhaps I had not written as clearly as might have been or as gracefully as could have been. And so we, we, we slightly edited because the person in that case said, well, you know, this isn't, uh, I can read it, but it's going to, I think I may trip a little over this. And I thought, well, that's, that doesn't serve anyone if you, if you stumble over it. So we rewrote it. Another person was so, was so excited by the text that they were presented that they asked for more details. So we supplied more details. So to that extent, there was a give and take. Uh, the Hispanic Society, of course, as we uh, know these pieces and we've worked with them, there are certain points and things that we want to convey. And in the process of conveying them, it's been very heartening to see how people have responded to that. Uh, I would add, uh, Patrick, and I, because I don't think we mentioned it, that of course, uh, all of the audio is in both Spanish and English. Yes, yes. Christine, are there any other questions? Otherwise, um, I think perhaps we can end the tertulia here. Wonderful, thank you. There's just one final related and clarifying question. Let's and it's, it's just about how does the audio 
content differ from the text? Oof. Um, well, from which text? Because ultimately the, uh, the, the, the text on the panels that the viewer will see is the shortest because nobody want, we don't want people reading. We want people looking. But by the same token, you have to give them a, a, a guide and the, the crucial points. The idea was that, uh, that people should look and to give them the fact, the, what, the basic points so that their looking could be as meaningful as possible. Then through the website and with its text and the audio guide are two different ways to get further, to acquire further information. There is a degree of overlap between them because ultimately we're, we, we started by be saying, what are the key points that we think in terms of facts and history and interpretation that these works require to understand. I mean, you know, the, I showed the map of, of the Ukayali River. It's, what, to look at it, you need to understand where it is, what, what the context is around it. So those, are, we, we established what we wanted people to know as, so that they could begin to look at it in a meaningful way. Similarly, with something like the Costas paintings, you have to explain what a Costa painting is, what this genre is, so that people can begin to make sense of it. And those, there's a commonality because it's one message that we're trying to get across and we're using the various technologies to bring it to people because some people may choose they don't want to read, they just want to listen. Some people may say, I don't want to hear someone talk to me, I want to read. And so the idea was that there should be overlap because it's one message and you can't assume that one person is going to do all of them. I would be thrilled to think that the audience is going to be so enthused that they will read the label, then read the entire website and then read the audio guide. I'm sure there are people who will do that, but they will be a devoted and dedicated minority whom I applaud, but I can't assume they're going to be the, re the um, statistical majority there. Well, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Patrick. I think that was a, a, a very clear and good explanation. And thank you for your, for your uh, presentation. And thank you to all of our members uh, for helping making it a, a successful tertulia, thanks to uh, your good questions and comments. Uh, we are thrilled uh, our community and uh, supporters continue to stay involved with the Hispanic Society, despite our inability to join in person. And I remind you that our next tertulia will take place on Tuesday, October 6th at 5 p.m. And uh, we will be hosted by uh, Margaret Connors McQuaid, the Assistant Director and Curator of Decorative Arts at the Hispanic Society. And she will discuss a Bucaro de las Indias from our collection. Uh, please be sure to join us as a member if you would like to participate in our next tertulia and by all means become a member in order to do so. So thank you all and have a wonderful evening.